Have you ever had a dream feel so real that it felt like a reality? So real that you convince yourself it is a reality and implicate you and your friend into an unsolved murder. It started off as just a dream for Charles Erickson but turned into a nightmare in reality for him and his friend Ryan Ferguson. This is the case of the dream killer. Columbia, Missouri is where our case will be taking us today, so let's dive a little deeper into our settings so you can see what we're dealing with here. Columbia is the county seat of Boone County, located in mid-Missouri. It's home to University of Missouri, which was founded on the 11th of February 1839 and houses the famous David R. Francis Quadrangle, which is pretty fucking cool. It currently has more than 30,000 students in 2020 and was the first public university west of the Mississippi River just in case you were ever wondering, you know. It's the fourth most populous and fastest growing city in Missouri with an estimated 124,769 residents as of 2020. Amongst these people lived Ryan W. Ferguson. Ryan Ferguson was born on the 19th of October, 1984 in Columbia, Missouri. Ryan in 2001 was just 17 and on a night out with one of his friends, Charles Erickson, who too, was just 17. The pair were out attending various Halloween parties in the area. Given they were four years under the legal limit in America, this made getting into bars a problem. Ferguson's sister met them at a bar called By George and a bouncer would allow them into the bar despite their young age. Super responsible. After a couple more drinks, the pair departed in the early hours of November the 1st, 2001. The pair were pretty fucked up, blackout drunk level fucked up. Erickson was under the influence of cocaine, Adderall and alcohol, an extremely deadly cocktail and not just a porn star martini. On that same night at the party, in the early hours of the 1st of November 2001, Kent Heitholt, who was aged 48, was leaving his work at the Columbia Daily Tribune where he worked as a sports editor. Before leaving his work at around 2.12am and 2.20am, he had a short conversation about work with his co-worker Michael Boyd. Michael Boyd would be the last person to see Kent Heitholt alive. Shauna Ornate, a janitor, was outside having a wee smoke break. While puffing her cig, she spotted two shady figures lurking suspiciously near Kent's car. Concerned, she went inside to alert her supervisor Jerry Trump to what she'd just seen. The two shouted, someone's hurt over here man, to the two janitors before fleeing the scene. Shauna and Jerry then alerted the other employees before phoning the police at 2.26 a.m. Upon arriving, the police found Kent beaten with a blunt object and strangled with a belt, his own belt in fact. He was pronounced dead at the scene. The police questioned both witnesses and Shauna even gave them a composite sketch. More importantly, there were fingerprints in and on Kent's car as well as a hair in Kent's hand and footprints in the blood around the crime scene. And that was it. The case went completely dry. Well, for about two years, until October 2003, when a certain Mr. Charles Erickson started sleeping a little too much and dreaming a tad too heavy. This was the birth of the dream killer. As you can remember, Charles Erickson in his fucked up state couldn't remember nothing, nada, of what happened that night of November the 1st. By chance when reading the newspaper, he stumbled upon an article in the local newspaper about the case. From this point onwards, his dreams would be full of Kent and the murder, convincing himself that on the night of his blackout that he and Ryan Ferguson were the ones who killed him. After all, he couldn't remember anything, so you never know, anything's possible. He brought up to Ryan, who had been a good friend, said there was no way either of them could have been involved. Another month passed and this was still playing on Charles mind. He sees the composite sketch that was drawn by Shauna and this was the deal breaker. In his eyes it resembled him. He was the killer, well, in his eyes. Charles brought up to many friends, telling them that he was a murderer. He seemingly wouldn't shut up about it. Two of these friends, Nick Gilpin and Art Figueroa, would be so concerned with his claims that they reported it to the police. Snitches. Of course after this, Charles Erickson was brought in for questioning, now get ready to be heated. This is injustice and how not to conduct an interview. Yeah, I think he said, 
I'd always want to kill someone before I was 60 anyway. What night was this that this that this happened down here at the Tribune? Was there a special occasion? It was Halloween, yeah. Halloween, okay. So that night, when you see Ryan choking out, do you think that Ryan was choking to make sure he was dead? Yeah. Yeah? Did he say that, or is that just you thinking that? That's what I think. Okay. Was there anything taken from the guy that we will know where it's at or we'll be able to find? I think his dad found the wallet. Ryan's dad found the wallet? Yeah, but I don't know. Okay. Ryan's dad was absolutely not at the crime scene, nor find the wallet. Not for certain on that? No. Okay. And what did you say earlier about what you thought he choked him with? Or it's possible he may have choked him with something, is that right? Yeah. But you don't know what it was? No. Okay. There was obviously a lot of injuries to this guy, so it was, it's pretty obvious that he was hit more than once, but you're not sure who did that, right? Yeah. So you, basically your feeling, or what you're recalling... I think I just blacked out. Okay. After you hit the guy and he went down, you see Ryan choking him. I mean, yeah. I mean, I blacked out in between when I hit the guy and, and when I see this lady, basically. Okay, but you did see Ryan choking him out? Yeah. Okay. All right. I hang on this for just a second. We'll try to find this Dallas guy. I'll be right back with you, okay? Okay. Uh, now you said earlier that, that after you hit after you hit the guy that you got sick. Did you actually throw up or did you just feel you know do the right you? You did throw up. Yeah. Okay. We didn't find any vomit down there, so can you kind of point, pinpoint where you think you got sick at? I don't know. Was it in the park maybe or on, on some dirt or was it on concrete? Do you remember hearing that splashing sound? Yeah, I think. You think? Yeah. Not certain though, right? Yeah. Okay. He clearly indicates that he vomited at the crime scene, but there was no vomit to be seen, indicating he wasn't actually where he thought he was. As you can see, the detective completely disregards this. That's fine. Back to the ranch. These are just my notes, so I remember to ask you. You said it was like, kind of like a tire tool style wrench, is that right? Yeah. It wasn't like a crescent wrench or... I mean, independent one. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Going back to when you said that, that, that you hit this guy with, with, the, with, the, with the tool. You said you, got, you kind of got sick after that. Um, how many times did you think you hit him all together? Just once. Just once. Well, the only problem that, the only problem I have with that is I know that he was hit more than once yeah. with, with the tool. Because I'm saying like was, I just hit him once. You just hit him once. You didn't hit him more than no. like because ten I, times. I just need to remember the first time that I hit him. I like I I just I remember hearing this noise and it just and just seeing his face and it just made me sick. And the noise was him screaming. No, it was like a groan. Okay. All right. Okay. You'd said earlier though that it was possible that you may have hit him more than once. Is that, di is that different now? No, I didn't hit him more than once. Okay. All right. Kent was found severely battered, not just one blow, like Charles claims. Officer creating a false narrative, claiming he said things that he never, in an effort to incriminate him further and match the actual narrative of the real crime scene. What kind of shoes was you wearing that night? I don't know. Let's go back to. When you were talking about how you saw Ryan strangle this guy. Now, we know what the guy got strangled with. That's kind of a thing I've been holding back from you. Uh -huh. All right. Is it possible that you know what he was strangled with and just didn't want to tell me? Because I, I know. I, no, was. like I think it was a shirt or something. Or okay, well, I know it wasn't a shirt. It was like uh, maybe a bungee cord or I don't something from his car. I don't okay. see why he'd have a rope in his car. As you can see, Charles clearly has no idea what was used to kill Kent, thinking it was a bungee cord or a shirt when in reality it was his own belt, nothing like the other two that he thought. Well, we know for a fact that his belt was ripped off of his pants and he was strangled with his belt. Really? Yeah. Do you see a belt in Ryan's hand? Something look like a rope maybe or a bungee cord? I don't know. Okay. You didn't put anything in your hand then? No. Okay. I mean, I don't remember that at all. Okay. Um, something else that I need to ask you about. We felt like, you know, I asked you earlier if, if you had gotten hit by this guy or anything like this, but you said he kicked you in the balls when you guys I, attacked. I, They're flipping out and I don't know what's going on. We know you know what's going on. Maybe you forgot some of it, but you didn't forget all that you're telling me. Number one, I just went and looked at this guy's crime scene photographs, but hopefully for the last time until I, I have to look at him again. Multiple, multiple, multiple contusions, hits, and strikes on this guy's head. There is no way in hell that you hit this guy once, turn and got sick. If you only hit him once, turn away and got sick, 
you had to hand the thing off to Ryan because this guy's got head wounds all over his head. We're talking minimum 15 strikes. I must have done it, bud. I mean, I don't know okay. either that or I stopped and he did it. I don't know. Did you ever drop the pipe? Probably. Did you hand it off to Ryan? I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. So when you say that you must have flipped out, then maybe you flipped out and hit this guy more than once. Yeah. Because there's no way that this guy got hit with once. And I'm not, I'm not barking at you. I'm just telling you the truth because I saw a picture of that. It's just, I don't, I don't. You got the car stuff working. I know. Yourself. I mean, I know. I mean, I, that's okay. fine. And I, I know. And I told you that. Already. Okay, I understand. But I'm just reminding you where we were at. Yeah. I, I don't. Because what's going to happen eventually? I'm sure the crime stopper will come forward now that they know that all this is coming to a head. That's fine. And I, I got to impress this upon you one more time. And, and this is the last time I'm going to tell you this, Chuck. Okay. Yeah, I know. Ryan's going to talk. Don't let Ryan tell the story for you. I don't know what else to do because I can't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if he's going to put it on me. Like, I, I don't really Probably. care. Probably. I don't care. Okay. I mean, I must have you, just... You know you're involved and you're ready to take that hit, basically. Yes. Okay. All right. You want to leave that, you want me to light that for you before I go, or? I've got a lighter. In your pocket? Yeah. Well, don't be burning nothing in the wall, man. No, I'm not going to. Here, why don't you give me your lighter? I'm not, you're not supposed to have that up here. Oh, no, actually, I don't. Okay, I didn't think so. I just keep saying. Um, I wanted to start off by, by just telling you a little bit about what uh, what I've learned, and, and that is that, um, you know, the officers, has, they've gone to Kansas City, and, and they've gotten in touch with Ryan, and to make a long story short, Ryan is saying, I don't know anything, wasn't there. Uh, I don't know what Chuck's talking about. He's crazy. Uh, if he, you know, if it happened, if it went down the way he said, he obviously did it himself. Um, and pretty much, that's what's happened. I, now, I mean, I'm, I, I, I don't know. I, I think Detective Short probably explained to you earlier when you visited with him that, you know. Pretty much, Ryan's story could, could come out in any form or fashion. Uh, I don't know specifically what he told you. Yeah. But, you know, Ryan could say anything from that was his entire idea uh, to I wasn't there, have no idea what he's talking about. Man, the guy must be flipped out, you know. Um, <clears throat> to, well, hey, I was there, but, you know. Uh, I didn't know we were going to do anything like that, and, and first thing I know, Chuck's over there beating up on some guy. Again, shamefully coercing him into a narrative that fits the crime scene to turn against his friend Ryan by making it seem that Ryan will go against him and perhaps incriminate him as the key player in the crime. So you never know what kind of, what, what form uh, their story is going to take, and uh, certainly from what you've explained to us, it's, it's bottom line not true. Now, with that, here comes the importance of our conversation, and that is to go back from the very beginning to the point that, that uh, it was even merely suggested that you guys leave. I don't know. I mean, like, I don't even, it's just so foggy, like, I could just be sitting here fabricating all of it and not know. Like, I don't know. I don't. Literally telling the officer he doesn't know when it's foggy, yet yeah, the officer continues pressing him. Well, now, let me go back one step further. You don't know exactly who brought it up initially. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, because I, it's just, it's, I just... Because now, now, like Detective Short told you, Ryan, and, and I don't think you and I have even gone there, um, there's specifics about this whole thing that you provided that there was no way for anyone, including yourself, to even know. Bottom line, there would, would be no way um, if you hadn't have been involved and been uh, there. So my angle to you is I need to know as much information about what Ryan said to you that's, and what that's Ryan the, did. That's the best I can tell you. Like, I don't... Okay, well, let's start. You start. You, you were at the club, right? Yeah. 
And my understanding is, and I, I'm just going to try to uh, briefly explain to you uh, what, what my understanding is, is, is that uh, you guys needed money. I, this is, this is, all right, this is after reading the newspaper article in October. Mm -hmm. and Literally saying he's making presumptions off what he'd read in the newspaper along with his dream. How is any of this credible? And this is kind of what I put together with, I mean, I don't know if I'm just flipping out or whatever, but I mean, this is kind of what I put together with what could have happened. We, I remember we were at the club, we ran out of money, like he'd been asking his sister to borrow money, and then from there on, I'm just kind of presuming what happened. I'm making presumptions based on what I read in the newspaper. Well, you're making accurate presumptions that, like I said, that you would only know if you were there. Like what? What the the lady, the cleaning lady? That's one. That was in the newspaper. Well, no, about what was specifically said she to that to get lady. Out? I mean, no, no, you explained. I'm not going to go. Doesn't actually state any other presumptions. He could only know about if he was physically there because there are none. I was saying, like, I wouldn't be here if I didn't feel guilty about it, but it's just, I don't, I can't recollect, and it's just a trip for me to mm -hmm. have to sit here and try to look at something that happened that I've read about and try to base well, what I, mean, I remember off of that, you know, it's, let, it's let's, a mindfuck. Let, let's, let's just stop right here, okay? Now, <clears throat> one thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to sit here and listen to this kind of gibberish, okay? That's not, I'm not gonna waste my time doing it. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Wait, now listen, it's my, I'm gonna start talking okay, I'm and you're gonna start listening, okay? All right, I'm gonna be point blank with you, pal. Right now, your hind end is the one that's hanging over the edge and Ryan could care less about it. Okay. Okay, do you understand me? Yes. Okay, Yes. now, you better start thinking very clearly okay because it's you that is on this chopping block okay am i clear yes. to you yes now do we need to go by or go back and go through this step by step no well, i think we do and that's what we're going to do and I don't want to hear, oh, all of a sudden I just think I'm going to refabricate all this. And, uh, wow. No. As you can see, going through the whole story again, hoping the added pressure will get Charles to fold and give in to the narrative, that the pressure of jail will make him want to blame it all on Ryan and match the consistencies of the crime itself. What I want to hear is exactly what Ryan told you because that's what's going to keep you in a position to where you're not going to be the sole individual out here responsible for what happened to Kent. Okay. Okay? Yeah. I can't be any more clear to you than that. I understand. And you need to understand it. Okay. We're going to start back at the club. Whose idea was it to go get money because you wanted drinks, you wanted dope, or whatever you I, wanted? I wanted to go home. That was Ryan's idea. Ryan's idea, and the best of my knowledge, yes. I don't want to even hear whose idea, or best of my knowledge, whose idea was it? It was Ryan's idea. Ryan's idea. And what did he tell you? That we needed some more money for drinks, and the sister wouldn't give us any more money. Okay. And he said, we're going to do what about it? We're going to rob somebody. You're going to rob somebody. And so that led up to you and him leaving together? Yes. And you went to where? We went to the Tribune building. Well, before that, you went where? We went to his car. To his car, which was parked where? Down whatever street that is, the by Georgia Law. Where we drove through earlier, you and I and the other two detectives, yeah. on, on First Street. Mm -hmm. It was parked alongside the street. And you went there for what reason? To get something out of his car. Get the something out of to, his car. To get a weapon out of his car. To get a weapon out of his car. Case what we try to do. Turn Whose to idea him. was it to go to the car to get a weapon out of the car? It was his. His idea. Yes. And how did he articulate that to you? Basically that we're young, we're in high school, and we'd fucked up if we used to go try to rob someone just regularly without anything. So you're young, you're afraid you get fucked up because you're not a big stature, and you wanted to go to the car 
to get something out of the car, a weapon. Yes. In order to do what with it? If it came down to it. If it came down to it. To beat someone with it. To beat someone with it. To possibly beat them. To death. To death? Hopefully. Hopefully? Hopefully not, no. I mean, hopefully it wouldn't come to that. But you went there with the knowledge yes. of getting a weapon, and it could come to that. And it did. And it did come to that. Yes. And who took the weapon out of the car? Out of the car? Yes. I don't know if I carried it from the car. I don't, I'm pretty sure that he took it out of the car, but I think that I carried it after that. He carried, he got it out of the car, apparently transferred it to you, and you carried it from the car to the Tribune building. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. What did Ryan carry with him? I don't think anything. And you described that weapon as what? I think it was, it was skinny. And I, so, I mean, I don't think it was a wrench to get the lug nuts off the tire. I think it was something for, like, the jack. Like a handle for the jack. I think it had a handle on it, actually. Like, it was, it looked like a question mark with, like, a long, like, the top's very small. And then it went, like, a question mark. So you twist it like this. I can draw Like you, a, I can like a ratchet? Can I draw you a picture? Sure. <sighs> As you can see, this is the most coerced, disgusting interview ever. The whole of the time, the officer is manipulating a clearly vulnerable Charles into saying what he wants to hear, picking on his clearly fragile state. Put it this way, imagine you and I are going up for drinks, me getting blackout drunk and two years later I go to the police and say I dreamt about participating in a murder that happened down the street that night. There's no evidence to indicate that I was there, or you, only my dreams. And shit, the account of my dream doesn't even match the narrative of the crime scene. How credible is that? And to make matters worse, the police officer is the biggest fucking dick you've ever met in your life, pushing a narrative down your throat. I think he could have told Charles anything on that day and he would have believed it. It's sick. Anyone would fold under that kind of pressure. Here is Ryan Ferguson's interview, on the other hand. Sometimes things go horribly, horribly wrong. See, I know where you're going just now. And the thing about this, if they're, if they're, if they're, if they're, if they're going to nail you with it, if they're going to, if they're going to pin this on you, you know, you might as well get it. If, if that's going to happen, regardless, and, and I, you know, it looks like they got all this stuff and all this evidence. If they're going to pin it on you, you might as well get it pinned on you for the right reasons. Yeah, that's exactly what I said to you earlier, man. I didn't. Oh my God, trying to get me to admit to something I didn't do. I didn't do it. I mean, take me down and wait until trial, man. Just take me down to jail because I didn't do anything. I'm not being to something I didn't do. do, you, do you, I understand. But do you think that if you, do you think if you go down to jail and by, you know, a lot of times when we talk to people, they think, you know, if I just maintain my, that I didn't do it, I didn't do it, that it's all going to go away? You think no, it will? I know if I did something, they would, no, that I did it. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'm innocent. Because okay, so you're innocent of killing this guy. I'm innocent of even being there. I'm not involved in this in any way. All right. That's I mean that it's it's the truth. There's nothing I can do or say about that to make it different. I mean I have I mean my hope is I don't have any hope, man. I'm going to jail for something I didn't do. I'm not going to admit to doing it to get a lesser sentence because I didn't do it. But if it didn't go down just the way this guy's saying, why should you take the rap or something? something because I don't have a choice. I don't have a choice, man. I'm you telling them what happened. I'm telling them what happened. But what if you still had the choice to tell your side of the story and it wasn't exactly like what this, whatever this other guy's saying was? That why is, not? Look, look, I want to be straight up with you, man. I really don't appreciate you coming in here and doing this. All right, I told them the truth. All right, no matter what, that is the truth. That's what happened. All right, I'm, I'm not hoping that anything changes. I'm hoping that they realize that I didn't have anything to do with it. I'm hoping that the evidence will prove that I didn't do it. They're not, though. They don't believe you. Well, I mean, that sucks. Take me to court. I mean, I have to go to trial, dude. I, mean, I didn't do anything. And I'm not going to admit to doing something I didn't do. I can't do or say anything else about it. You know, 
know, when something happens that you make, you know, if you make a mistake, people understand you don't really want to come out with it because we're ashamed. I understand that, you know? and I've done that with things, but this is definitely not one of those cases, man. I've not done anything. I've told them the truth, and all I can do is sit here and wait and have a million people try to talk me into saying I did something I did not. It's not fun. I guess I'm just trying to get you, I'd like to see you help yourself. And I think you still can help yourself. Because you think I did it? I don't know what happened, you know? Well, look at this right man. I didn't do it yourself. Yourself. Okay. And the only way I can help myself is by admitting to something I didn't do. That's what you're saying. No, not really. That's exactly what you're saying. Let's say, for instance, this other fellow, uh, Chuck, let's say this was all something he... It was his idea. Let's say that he's trying to pin this whole thing on you because he paints a pretty bad picture. Well, maybe that. Maybe he is, but I wasn't with him. I don't know anything about it. Do you think it would make it easier for him if you were able to to come clean on what happened? I, I, I am. I am come maybe. clean. All right. But if you hadn't, if you hadn't, do you think it would make it easier for your mom and dad? Your mom in particular. If you said mom. Well, if I done something, yes, but I hadn't. I don't know how many times I have to say this to you guys. I have not done anything. I was not there. I did not do anything. But if there's a way that you could help yourself, you'd do it. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm doing it. Okay. I'm doing it. I'm telling the truth, so I'm doing what I can. I mean, if you know what this is like, man, let me talk to my dad. Let me talk to my mom. So I only get one phone call, and then I gotta call my dad to get Water feed, like I call them mom, so she doesn't. Let me find out about all that. Okay. As you can see from start to finish, he sticks to the one story that he absolutely did not do it. There's no doubt in his mind, despite the effort from the police again, unlike Charles Erickson, who changed multiple times through the police's influence. After these set of interviews, in March 2004, Ryan and Charles are arrested and charged with Kent's murder. The trial of Ryan W. Ferguson took place in 2005, four whole years after the murder. Charles was offered a plea deal to testify against Ryan, and boy, did he testify. And I hit him. You hit him just like that? Well, I hit him harder than that. How'd you hit him? I hit him like that. And he turned after I hit him the first time, and he put his hands up. I kept hitting him. And how did you do it? Just, just like this. I saw a lady and I saw in the door that she came out of there was a light on inside. I was really upset. I was almost on the verge of tears when I yelled. What did you yell? I yelled, I yelled, I yelled, go get help. This man needs help. What happened next? And I, I came around to Ryan's right from behind him and to his right. And he was down here and he had a belt and he had his, he had his foot on his back, on the victim's back and he was pulling up on the belt. You know, I told you before, I have no interest in putting anybody that didn't do it in jail. Yes, you did. I guess it's never too late. Tell us now if it was all a dream. I did this. He did this. I didn't dream anything. He went into grossly meticulous detail about how he watched Ryan strangle Kent on the night of November 1st, 2001. And remember that guy, the janitor supervisor, Jerry Trump? Oh yeah, suddenly in prison, after his wife sent him an article about the case, upon seeing photos of Ryan and Charles, he identified them as the people seen standing over Kent. How in the fuck can someone go from not being able to identify them to being able to, four whole years have passed? Shit, it's not add up. Ryan was convicted of second degree murder and robbery. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Erickson was sentenced to 25 years in prison after testifying. The story doesn't end here however, no no, because believe it or not, there are still some good people out there in the world, especially Kathleen Zellner. If you don't know about Zellner, she is one of the most high profile attorneys there is, working in cases such as Stephen Avery's for making a murderer, and she wasn't for this wrongful conviction. It's clear something suspicious was going on in this case, and she went pro bono, which means working for free in 2009 to right these wrongs. 
and the man at the head of this corruption and unjust was the prosecutor, Kevin Crane, the mastermind behind it all. So let's break down some of these wrongs real quick and you'll see there's a fair few. So first of all remember, all that DNA left at the crime scene, the hair, the blood and the fingerprint, well, none of it matched Ferguson's or even Erickson for that matter. Charles also claimed that Crane talked him into lying at trial to help send Ferguson down. Shauna Ort, one of the janitors at the crime scene, told Kevin Crane that she did not see Ryan at the crime scene, which he never bothered to mention and kept to himself. I said it wasn't them. I, I told my boyfriend, I told everybody I knew. At some point then, did you um, meet with the prosecutor about being a witness in the case? Yes. And who was that prosecutor you met with? Crane. That Kevin Crane? Kevin Crane, yeah. Did you tell him about seeing the pictures on the Yeah, that's the first thing I told him when I, I, we first talked. But that was not the kids I seen. So you told him definitely? I told him several him. times. He scared me. Crane. So you were scared of Mr. Crane? Yeah, he just kind of intimidated me. He made me feel like I was wrong about what I was saying. Trump would retract his statement about his wife sending him the article and claim that the prosecutor Kevin Crane pressured him in testifying against Ferguson. In reality, he'd seen the photos after his release in 2004. Crane also told Trump that it would be helpful for him to identify Ferguson as having been at the crime scene. A prosecutor encouraging a witness to lie and pressure him into lie under oath in court, not exactly a good look on the prosecution and their credibility, is it? Now before we go any further, we gotta talk about something called the Brady violation because this was a prime example and boy, believe me, there's more to come. Brady disclosure consists of knowingly withholding information and evidence that is material to the guilt or innocence or to the punishment of a defendant, basically withholding important shit that it influences the jury's opinion, verdict and overall outcome of the trial. Can you state your name for us please? William Hawes. Alright, and how are you presently employed? I'm retired. Okay. And uh, where did you work before retiring? Uh, Boone County Prosecutor's Office as an investigator. Did you work on your own or did you take orders from prosecutors, or both? Uh, basically, we're guided. You also talked about writing reports. Uh, you've been in this game a long time, right? I have. And you know the purpose of writing reports. That's right. Uh, you want to preserve or memorialize things, is that correct? That's correct. correct. So you can testify to things uh, at proceedings such as this. That's right. And you write, down, you write down a lot. It's not like you just pick and choose the super highlights, but you write down pretty much everything you do in an investigation of this magnitude, you always, try, you always try to. All right. Where's the, do you have a report on your phone call with Jerry Trump? No, I don't. Didn't write that one down, did you? No, when I was told there was no report, I was surprised. A report is made on everything, especially in a case of this magnitude, yet for some odd reason he didn't log down his calls this time round. Something shady to hide, perhaps? What exactly did he say? when he started to give you this information that he thought he could possibly identify the two people? What, what were the words he used? I saw their pictures in the newspaper and I recognized them. Do you know even if that prison allows articles to come in? I really don't. Because you know there are restrictions on the types of things that can be sent into a prison? There are. Where did he get the article? He said his wife sent it to him. When you went and talked to her, what did she say? She said she didn't recall sending it to him. You never talked to her, did you? I talked to her on the phone. When was that? Oh, uh, I, I don't know. It was some time after that, and she was very reluctant. Did she write a report on that? Did I, you write a report I, on that? I, no. I recall talking to her. And but again, you didn't write a report. I did not write a report. Again, another phone call failed to be reported on a case of this magnitude. By failing to disclose this phone call with Jerry Trump's wife, Barbara, Prosecutor Crane withheld evidence that would have allowed Ryan Ferguson's defense to challenge the credibility of Trump's testimony. Would you state your full name for the record? Michael Evans Boyd, Jr. When you turn that corner and start down the alley, do you see anyone? I see two people walking. Okay. Did you look in, in your mirror to see, if, see Mr. Heidholt? Yes. Is that the last time that you see him? Yeah. So you've turned um, the corner and you see these two individuals. Now, can you describe when you see them, uh, do you know whether they're, uh, what their race is? Are they Caucasian, African-American? I didn't pay attention because I 
right, so that, they startled me. Would it be fair to say you didn't get a good look at them? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you know if the two individuals were male or female? I didn't even pay that close attention at all. Do you know if they were white or darker skinned? No. Okay. Do you go to the, the Columbia Police Department to report that you have seen two individuals in the alley? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And who do you believe that you interviewed with? I thought it was John Short. And <clears throat> do you tell um, Detective Short exactly what you've told us about what you saw? That the two folks were walking through. Yes, ma'am. How long after the murder do you go back in and, and report um, that you've seen these two individuals walking down the alley? Within a year. Within a year? Yeah. Okay. And do you do that before you move to St. Genevieve? Yes, ma'am. So when you go back in and make that report, you're still employed at the Columbia Tribune? Yes. This is the last man who's seen Kent alive who too seen the men, revealing that his statement to the police was completely disregarded, which is another Brady violation. In fact, it wasn't just disregarded, it was fabricated and lied upon to incriminate Ryan and Charles. Interviewed by a state's attorney investigator, William Haas. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And do you give uh, William Haas the same information that you've just testified to about the two individuals? Yes. So once again, you tell him you don't know their race. I don't remember telling anybody anything about the race. So. Okay, and you don't remember telling him that they're male or female? No, ma'am. You don't tell him they're young or old or anything, right? No. You did write a report on this interview, is that right? Yes. And that's a two-page report with your name on the second page. Does that adequately reflect... Uh, your report of your interview with actually Charles Erickson and Mike Boyd? Yeah, yes. Okay. And you took down everything just as accurately as you could? Yes. And you say you asked Boyd about seeing the two individuals. He told you he said he saw two white guys. It's highlighted on the screen, too. Yes. That's what he told you? As I recall, yes. I don't remember telling anybody anything about the race. Could you please state your name? Kimberly Lee Bennett. Uh, what time did you say the bar started to close? It started to close around 1 a.m. Okay. Uh, Kim, are you 100% sure that you saw Ryan Ferguson leave the bar, get into his car, and drive away in the early morning hours of November 1st, 2001? 100%. Were you ever questioned about the matters I've been talking to you about today? Yes. And were you questioned by law enforcement? Yes. Two officers came to my house and questioned Amanda and I, um, you know, asking us if we knew anything. And, you know, we told them that we were there that night and that we, you know, exactly what's in my affidavit. Okay. So two officers, uh, are you referring to officers from the Columbia Police Department? Yes. Can you describe the two officers to the best of your ability? One of them was kind of taller with um, dark hair and the other one was a little shorter, stocky, and bald. And did you tell them that you saw Ryan and Chuck walk out of the bar, cross the street, and leave in Ryan's car? Yeah. Yes. When they were talking to you, did they appear to be writing anything down? Yes, they did. Did you talk to the police sometime in 2005? Did they come back and ask you some more questions? Yes. Okay. Did you testify at the trial of Ryan Ferguson? No. Were you contacted to testify at the trial of Ryan Ferguson? No. Were you ever contacted by any prosecutors, defense attorneys, anybody? No. I always assumed that, you know, I would have been called to trial. Um, why did you assume that you would have been called to trial? Because they, I assumed that Ryan's attorneys had a copy of the police report. And so, you know, if they needed me, they would have contacted me. It provided a solid alibi and was for some reason never disclosed. Yet another Brady violation. 
the amount of sheer faults and errors, the lies, are just insane. The prosecution doesn't have a leg to stand on at this point. After having their case essentially picked to pieces by the excellent work of Kathleen Zellner and our team, Ryan's charges were vacated in November 2013 on the basis that the prosecution withheld evidence from the defence team. Charles Erickson is unfortunately still in prison, serving that 25 year stint after pleading guilty and testifying against Ryan. I feel like this is completely unjust. The case is still declared as unsolved, so why should this man spend any more time in jail? Think about all the shadiness from Kane and the prosecution, all of the withheld evidence and fabricated bullshit. Has this man not served enough time for something that he more than likely didn't even commit? He was a vulnerable young man that he took advantage of to solve a murder. Despite being eligible for parole in 2020, he's still not free and that's why I've attached a change.org page to sign in favour of his freedom. He's spent enough of his life locked away already. Since being released from jail, Ryan Ferguson was awarded 11 million in compensation. He is still too trying to free his longtime friend despite incriminating him, offering a $10,000 reward for any info that helped solve the crime. As far as people like Kevin Crane and the prosecution, all the officers involved in this case are bottom of the barrel, scum, trying to land two young teens in jail and worst of all, actually succeeding, robbing them of the best years of their lives. They should face prosecution too, especially Kevin Crane. How many other people has he landed in jail? It's scary to imagine the amount of people in jail by scum like him. If you've made it this far, then you deserve a medal because it's a long one. It's an extremely interesting complex case that highlights the corruptness of the police and how easy it's for them to get what they want by spinning their own web of lies around reality for the prosecution and the public to see and something that must be cracked down on because it's clearly not a one-time thing. Take care, I'll see you in the next one. Mm -mm.